you know, I'm a graphic designer by background, but I've really gotten into photo and video here in the last few years. And, you know, I, the first real mobile app that I spent any time creating on is Lightroom mobile. Um, and, you know, got really comfortable editing photos and doing that kind of on the go. Um, but, you know, initially when I heard about tools like Photoshop and especially Illustrator coming to devices like iPad, you know, honestly, I was a little bit skeptical, but. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with the VP of Design for Digital Media at Adobe, Eric Snowden. No, not that Snowden. Also, we've had a ton of snowfall at the Obsessed Show HQ this week, so coincidentally, not that snowed in either that I'm talking about. Eric Snowden is driving the future of mobile creativity by leading a global team of designers to bring to life powerful new tools like Illustrator on iPad. I'm curious to hear why he believes mobility is the key to the future of design, as well as perspective on where mobile is headed for professional and amateur creatives alike. I'm very curious on this topic, especially when it comes to bringing core design tools to mobile devices. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Eric Snowden. Okay, kids, all the way from Oakland, California, please welcome Eric Snowden. Eric, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey, thank you for having me. Really glad to be here. Well, hey, um, it's great to have you on the show. You're, you know, one of many guests that we've had from Adobe headquarters. So it's cool to to bring in a fresh perspective. I've got a bunch of questions for you, but before we dig into the mobile tools and especially into Illustrator for iPad and some of the other things that you've um, had the really cool recent opportunities to work on, I love starting with origin stories. So maybe you could give us a little bit of a trip through the Wayback Machine and help our listeners understand how you got here. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. And and I think um, I'll try not to go down too many side streets on this because I I think I've had a pretty windy career leaving myself here. So, (laughs) you know, I I started out um, as a fine artist, mostly illustration, painting. Um, I did a ton of printmaking in college and I sort of fell into graphic design accidentally. I, I was a, one of my roommates in college was a graphic designer. And I think coming from a small town in the Midwest, the idea that people designed the things around us wasn't an idea that I had in my head, right? It was just things existed. They didn't mm-hmm. weren't created right. by anyone. And so it blew my little 18 year old mind when I realized that like everything in our world was created by someone. I'm like, oh, that's what I, that's what I want to do. Um, and so I started taking design uh, classes in college and I started, I started out as an illustrator. I was doing, um, you know, both hand-drawn illustration, but then like giant vector illustrations. I spent three months in a summer drawing tractors for John Deere as an example, um, again, being from the Midwest. And then, you know, I worked as a photo assistant. I was in advertising. I taught photography at Parsons. I worked in the music industry for about 10 years. Um, kind of had a long and winding career doing all sorts of different creative disciplines, which I think kind of builds me up to be an interesting character for a company like Adobe who makes a lot of different creative tools. And, you know, I joined um, Behance probably approaching um, a decade ago and we were acquired by Adobe after I joined. And that was sort of the path that led me here. That's super cool. Um, what was it like? Um, and, and maybe I don't know how long your tenure was at Behance, but, um, like going from the, the culture and kind of being acquired by a bigger company, what was that experience like? I was really excited about it. And maybe, you know, I, I think everybody goes through their own different steps in going through an acquisition, but being at Behance and being an Adobe customer and having built basically my entire career on top of the software, like when I got, when, when Scott Belsky, the CEO at the time, told me we were getting acquired, I was like, oh, well, that totally makes sense. Like, it just seemed really obvious the connection of the company that makes all the tools and then the company I was at that is helping, you know, people showcase and get their work out of the world and get opportunity just was, you know, totally made sense to me. I think um, Adobe is really good at 
respecting the culture of acquisitions. I think mm. the reason why Adobe acquires companies, certainly there are times where it's for technology or other things, but, but I think they're really respectful of the people and they know why they acquire companies. And so there was no big push to change Behance in any, you know, sort of detrimental way. It was really wonderful and easy transition. We had, um, you know, every acquisition sort of helps the next one out. So we had people from the Typekit acquisition, you know, helping us out and guiding us into the company. And it was about as smooth as you can expect. And I mean, it was smooth enough that six or seven years later, I'm still hanging around. So it worked out pretty well. Um, tell us a little bit, because I know Adobe employees are kind of spread out all over the world, but tell us a little bit about your immediate team. Like what's, yeah. what's the size of that team and what's kind of the footprint? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm trying to think of the last time I actually counted. So I'll, I'll estimate some of this stuff, but I would say my sort of direct reporting chain is probably about somewhere between 150 and 200 people. Um, which when you say it out loud, sounds like a lot. And then when you start to look at the number of products we have across the number of devices and you look at multidisciplinary teams, it starts to not feel like a lot. I think that's one of the things I love about design in Adobe is like the individual product teams are, you know, they're, they're big enough to make an impact, but they're small enough where you feel like you have agency and you're making things happen. Like you don't feel like you're in charge of, you know, button corner roundness or something like really arbitrary thing. You feel like you're <laughs> contributing to the future of these, you know, really important products. And so, um, yeah, that's about the size of my team. I would say globally, the product design team at Adobe is around 350 people. We have centers of gravity um, in, in the Bay Area, you know, San Francisco and San Jose. We have a big office in New York and Seattle, um, two large offices in India. But then we have people in Hamburg in Minnesota, we have remote people. It's a little bit all over the place. So we've got like these clusters of offices that have a lot of people in them. But, you know, in any given day, even pre COVID, you're talking to a lot of people on video. And, and we're, we were pretty good at remote even before this all happened because we're, you know, sort of a mixed company when it comes to that. Yeah. So, um, Switching over to the mobile conversation a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a graphic designer by background, but I've really gotten into photo and video here in the last few years. And, you know, I the first real mobile app that I spent any time creating on is Lightroom Mobile um, and, you know, got really comfortable editing photos and doing that kind of on the go. Um, but, you know, initially when I heard about tools like Photoshop and especially Illustrator coming to devices like iPad, you know, honestly, I was a little bit skeptical, but um, yeah. I had the pleasure of being there in person in L.A. when you guys unveiled uh, Illustrator for iPad at Adobe Max in 2019, I think it was. Um, and and I was like immediately really blown away. You know, when they said we're going to unveil this thing, I was like, "Ooh, what's that going to be like? But <laughs> it was it was really interesting to see how well it was. I mean it was really well thought through. It was really interesting. And there were parts of it that I thought, man, that almost works better when it comes to sketching and using Apple pencil and those kind of things. But, um, talk me through kind of what led to that. Like what was, yeah. were you involved in the early timeline and, and how did, how did this product, um, come to fruition in the way that it did? I mean, I think there was so many dynamics that led up to that. And, you know, it was a, a big cross-functional global team that made it happen. Um, I, my first piece of Adobe software ever was Adobe Illustrator. And I won't say which version, but if this is high enough fidelity, you can see the gray hairs and realize you can probably guess. Um, but it was the first piece of Adobe software I had ever used. I was a traditional illustrator. I got a job at an illustration firm. They sat me down on the first day and gave me a, a Wacom, which I'd never seen before, and put me in front of Illustrator, which I'd never used before, and said, you have to learn how to draw in this thing. And um, I remember that first experience of using the pen tool and Bezier Curves and, frankly, being sort of terrified and frustrated with it. And after a couple of days, then realizing, wow, I can do some amazing things with this program. But there, that initial curve was, you know, 10 feet tall. And so 
that experience for me personally really informed specific features that are in Illustrator on the iPad. I look at the pen tool and Illustrator is still one of my favorite tools Adobe's ever made. And I get the power of it, but I was like, how do we help people onboard to this thing? There's a, there's a new pencil tool inside of Illustrator that we, you know, demoed at Max that I'm sure you saw that was a direct reaction to that. It was like, Mm -hmm. what should everybody's first vector tool be? And our answer for Illustrator on the iPad was, was not the pen tool. It was this new pencil tool. And I think part of that was obviously wanting to make it easier for new people to learn. But part of it was like, we have this and we don't have this on the desktop always. Right. And so it's weird. This just happens to be sitting next to me. That was totally, <laughs> that's how close my Apple pencil is. <laughs> at all times it is like within arm's reach. And that's not actually a joke. It's totally true. Um, that was something we really thought about. It's like, how do we, make the learning curve for this easier. But we also wanted to make sure that we weren't building a toy. It had to be something people could do professional work in. So under the hood, it's creating paths and beziers and all the things you would need to do professional work. We're just simplifying the input of that. And so I think that was like a direct connection from personal experience to the product. And then beyond that, we had an amazing design team and amazing engineering team. We talked to tons of customers. And between all that, there were things that we heard that were hard to do in Illustrator on the desktop. We tried to tackle some of those. We tried to really respect the iPad and say, like, this isn't a desktop computer. We have to rethink things. Um, We also believe that just being on the iPad wasn't enough, that it also had to have unique capabilities that got people to go like, oh, I wasn't... To your point, I wasn't so sure about this, but like, mm-hmm. I'm going to give that a shot. And I think some of what we did with the repeats um, that um, DePanchana, who was one of the designers on the project, who was my partner in the keynote that year, she got to show a lot of the repeat stuff. And that was coming out of like, A, there's a need for this because this is too hard to do today. Um, B, it's very expressive and like people were creating all sorts of new things we'd never seen before with it, which is something we think about a lot in creative tools is like, how do we unlock new kinds of creativity? Um, But also something that's like, hey, I'm not sure I was going to give that that iPad thing a shot, but that looks interesting. Let me see. And then once we sort of hooked you with that, I think people saw the rest of the product and saw the thought that went into it and got excited about it. But it was really a balance of a lot of us being Illustrator users for a very long time, like what was our dream list of things we wanted? Um, mixing that with like, what is the iPad great at? And it's great at a ton of things. Talking to customers. And then, you know, Adobe has a really amazing research team um, who helped us sort of break out of the norms we were in. I think it was a mixture of a lot of different things that that led to that product. Well, I mean, who who could have predicted that you know, just a few months after the launch of Illustrator for iPad, we'd be in COVID and everything else. Um, I would imagine that Adobe has seen trends or changes or differences in how people are either going to mobile or using less mobile during uh, the pandemic. Um, Speak to that a little bit. I'm just kind of curious, you know, what the response has been, especially to Illustrator, but I mean, to your other mobile suite as well. Yeah, I mean, with Illustrator, it's um, it's harder to tell because you're right. It launched like two months before the world shut down. Um, but for a lot of other products, we've definitely seen increased usage, and I think why we've probably many of us have experienced that in our own lives. Where you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm I'm drawing more and editing photos more. I'm doing sort of fun, creative tasks more than when I was, you know, commuting a couple hours every day. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, trying to fill my life with joy and making making things is a, is a, is a big part of that. And so, I, I, and I also think people are trying new things, whether they unfortunately lost their job or they want to do something different or they have more free time or whatever that dynamic is. And I know it's different for everybody. People are learning new skills. And um, I, I think... It, creative skills are something that people are excited about learning. And maybe, you know, for all of the horrible, horrible things that have come with COVID, maybe one tiny little silver lining is people are like, hey, I'm going to try something I might not have tried otherwise. And I think being more creative is 
is driving people and may also just be causing them to think about their lives in a different way. And it's, it's really, it's really interesting. And at least for me, I know that I've taken on new creative hobbies during all of this, um, <laughs> which has sort of been a, a, a you know, uh, there's like a drum set, like halfway in the, oh, yeah. in the, in the, in the scene here. And that's, that was sort of my new creative hobby. I was like, well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to be home, I'm going to learn something new. Very cool. Um, and this may be something that you guys can't necessarily tell just by looking at the, at the usage data, but I'm curious, maybe from stories or things that you've noticed, um, how does illustrator for iPad tend to work into the process for most designers? Like, do you see it as more of a upfront, like it's a quick way to ideate and sketch, or is it more of a, you know, final finishing touches, or do you see a lot of designers are going back and forth from desktop to mobile? Like what, what do you think that looks like? Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, we see all of the above and we see some like clusters in certain places. And so, um, you know, within the Debbie design, we have a really great um, UX research practice and we've talked to a lot of users and done long-term lo- longitudinal studies with people who see their usage patterns. And so we have a really good sense of like when they're using it. And so I think the answer is when we were designing the tool, we wanted to make sure that if someone wanted to have an end-to-end experience, they could, right? And so everything you're doing sort of in the full screen mode, on screen with the pencil can feel very fluid and very gestural, but then you go into the properties panel and I can type in exact pixel dimensions and I can scrub through exact pixel dimensions. And we really thought about that experience because we know that Illustrator is a precision tool and we didn't want it to be something where oh, well, if you want to be precise, you have to go to the desktop. That wasn't the goal. I think when you look at really complex use cases, you look at you know huge companies that are doing production work or fashion, for example, Illustrator is not the beginning and end of the workflow. There's other tools they have to integrate, other things. So there are absolutely instances where people still need the desktop. And also Illustrator has is now version, um, I want to say 1.1. It's pretty early in its journey. And... We're adding more features all the time, but we didn't want it to be something where there was an artificial ceiling, right? We wanted it to feel like a professional tool and you may decide you'd rather do something on a desktop, but we didn't want that to be something we kind of like arbitrarily decided for you. We wanted to give users that choice. And so there are definitely people who are doing end to end work there. And there are people that are starting on desktop or starting on the iPad. We see lots of different variations of that, I think. Well, as you and I talked a little bit at the top of the show, uh, Illustrator for iPad is obviously not the only tool that you've been involved in, that you've uh, been part of the Adobe Fresco project as well. Um, and I think there's this deeper question that maybe some of our listeners have right now, which is, okay, Adobe has all these great design tools, you know, does Adobe use Adobe products to create Adobe <laughs> products? You know, is that, <laughs> I don't have a more meta question for you, but. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's interesting. We, we live that reality all day. So, I mean, you know, most of my team is a user experience design team and we're doing all of our design in, in Adobe XD. So we've got a couple of hundred people globally using that product all day, every day to design our UI. Um, we also have people who are doing brand work, who are using products like Illustrator, as you can imagine. We've got editors and animators who are using After Effects. And so um, it gets very meta at, at times. And I think, um, you know, we're the biggest champions, but also maybe the biggest critics of everything we do as every designer is of their own work. Um, I think the benefit of maybe other designers have is they can walk away from the things they do, whereas... You know, I have a meeting about one of our products and then five minutes later, I'm using one of our products to do something. So it's kind of hard <laughs> to escape. Um, but yeah, our design team is really focused on, you know, we use XD. Um, we're taking advantage of services like fonts and creative cloud libraries. We're working mobile. We're working on our desktops. Like we're, um, you know, collaborating through creative cloud. We're using all the creative cloud products. It's the way, it's just the way we work. And, you know, I think our transition you know, on to XD was a really natural one. We never told anyone they had to use it. We just feel like it's the best tool for the job. And, you know, I think we have a really unique challenge and scale at Adobe that, you know, we put that 
product through its paces. Um, but it's that's one of the things I I really love about my job is I love making things generally. And you know, I'll use Fresco on the weekend to draw, or I'll go and you know do a photo shoot and edit photos with with Lightroom. And it's it's kind of fun to blend those two things together. I think the challenge is to make sure that we don't treat ourselves like the sole customer, right? It's like uh, I have one very specific workflow for all these products and certainly I can help find bumps along the way. But if you compare, you know, how I work to, especially in my let's take video editing, like how I work versus someone who's got tens of millions of people on their social channel and producing every week to someone who's editing an Oscar winning film, the three of us, and that's just wildly oversimplifying our workflows look really different. Right. And so I think, we want to take what we learn from using the products ourselves, but we never want to over rotate on like, we know everything. We know how everyone works. And I mean, the beauty of Adobe's tools is they're like musical instruments. And so people who make pianos don't can't anticipate everything that someone could play with the piano. That's like impossible. Right. And in a similar way, like we're constantly surprised by what people make with our products. And that's, the most fun part of my job, at least in my opinion, is like we put out a new creative tool and someone does something we had never thought of with it. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I love this job. And there's a new creative thing out in the world that, you know, like probably would have happened, but might've happened, you know, this much differently. And we had like a tiny little impact on that. And that's, I think that's really, really fun and exciting. And as someone whose entire career has been mostly about helping other creative people, um, have better careers and lives. Um, it's, I don't know. It's awesome. I'm really, I feel really lucky. That's cool. So my, I've got two kiddos and, um, you know, they're both very creative and both like to draw and create art stuff. And I've never yeah. really pushed either one of them towards the graphic design direction specifically, but my, my eight-year-old started finding these Photoshop tutorial videos mm -hmm. on YouTube. And so now he's asking me about Photoshop and, you know, we've had four or five lessons and he's already starting to figure things out. I'm like, buddy, you know, there's like, there's at least three th ways to do every single thing that you can do, do in that program. Um, and so just get in there and play with it. And yeah. um, it's interesting just watching him playing around on an old MacBook air and <laughs> trying stuff out. And yeah. uh, it, it's pretty cool. And like, you've got, you get a significant head start on my <laughs> exposure to Photoshop. Yeah, that that's awesome. And I, you know, I, you know, as as a, you know, had my first job as an illustrator, but they're like outside of that, I would pick up this tool to learn this thing, or I want to do a project for a friend, or I was in a band and wanted to make a website, or whatever it ended up being, and just learn through these like really natural means of like getting excited about something, going like I think I can figure this out you know, jumping in on it, making something and having fun doing it. Um, but that's, that's really awesome. Well, you know, I, I like to ask a lot of our guests about what their typical day looks like. Um, and everybody's answer is almost always, I don't have a typical day, but, um, I think maybe the better <laughs> question here as it, you know, it only took me 150 some episodes to figure this out is, you know, what, what does your role entail? So what, what yeah. is part of your job? What things do you oversee? What things are you like, you know, in the vectors or in XD moving stuff around or like, you know, what, what does that role look like at Adobe? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I'm glad you sort of acknowledged, um, you, I mean, you knew what my answer was going to be. Nobody has a typical day. Um, so, I mean, I can talk about like how I see my role and maybe I can talk about some specifics. And so ultimately my job is to make sure that the designers at Adobe can create their best work. Like I'm a facilitator of hopefully great work. Um, getting smart, talented people to come work at Adobe and making sure to the best of my ability, they stay there for, I don't want to stay forever. That sounds like... <laughs> um, but like as long as like I want them I don't want people to leave I want to bring great people to Adobe and I want to keep great people at Adobe and that's a big part of my job and so that entails a lot of different things it helps it entails helping with recruiting it you know if someone's having a hard time it may be doing skip levels or one-on-ones it's making sure that teams have the resources they need it's making sure we've got um, 
either executive buy-in or air cover to try new ideas. It's, you know, me raising my hand and saying, you know, this isn't good enough. This is up to our standards or we should look at this problem in a different way. I think it takes on many forms, but like, I, I hope that in like my, in, when I do my job the best, I'm really helping bring to life the vision of like all of these other people on my team. And I think I use a lot of our products still. Like I, you know, edit photos in Lightroom, I draw on Fresco, I make things in Illustrator. Um, you know, I don't get my hands dirty with day-to-day -day design, but I I design presentations, um, which a lot of, um, you know, <laughs> design leaders end up doing. And I do all those in Adobe XD. That's my, my presentation tool. And so, um, and there'll be times where I'll jump in and collaborate on a, on a document. I try to be invited to those sessions versus like showing up and being like, surprise, um, I'm here. But um, so I, I do get involved. I think it's really important for me to stay connected to the work in a deep way. Like I have a really good sense of what all my teams are doing. And I think that's how at least I personally can help them the most. That's not everyone's style, but I'm a fairly hands-on in that way. Um, but at the same time, like I would never insult my really awesome designers by like jumping next to and being like, what if you did it like this? Like that would be like not something I would do or frankly recommend design leaders to do for the most part. Um, but I, I like staying connected to this stuff. I think using the tools and making things are what got me into this. And I, I've had jobs in the past where I've gotten too far away from the work and I don't work at those places anymore. Like I, I know what makes me happy and finding that balance between leadership and facilitating, but also keeping connected is something that I'm always like really trying to find. Is there anything that you would list as like one of your proudest professional moments? Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's so many of them. I think um, this one is the one that jumped out to me. So um, a couple of years ago, we launched a new painting and drawing product called Adobe Fresco. And as someone who started drawing when they were three years old, who like would be told to go to bed by his parents and be like under the sheets of the flashlight drawing, like, <laughs> like I was just, I was obsessed with drawing as a kid. And then once I started learning about Adobe's products and design and got into the design world, like that sort of became my like, new center of gravity, but I never lost or stopped caring about sort of the traditional stuff and the ability to bring those together and work with like the amazing scientists at Adobe and to have really weird conversations about like, <laughs> is this pencil pencil-y enough? And like, what makes something feel like a pencil? Like if you really try to describe a pencil to somebody who's never seen a pencil before, which is kind of how it works with engineering, right? They have to code these, these wild things and like trying to explain to an engineer why a pencil doesn't feel enough like a pencil is like a really weird abstract conversation to have. But wow, that it's super fun and super interesting. And it makes you <laughs> think about the tools you use in just a really different way and spend days thinking about like, how is a marker different than a pen? Like, it sounds like a strange question, but I bet you've never really thought about it enough. If you do, I bet it's harder to articulate than you think it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, it, I, that part of it, I really, really enjoyed. And then getting to combine my love for technology and my love for creatives and creativity and drawing into one place. And then to be on stage with, you know, Kyle Webster, who's like an amazing brush creator and amazing illustrator and like the nicest person in the whole world. And to be able to announce this tool and to, uh, have worked with so many awesome people on that project. Like that was really huge. And it's something that I'll like always be really proud of and really remember, I think. Um, you know, you've had a career that's gone from going backwards, Adobe Behance and, you know, teaching and music and um, so many pieces of the industry related to design. Um, I'm curious if you have anyone that sticks out as kind of, design hero as you were coming up in the business or, you know, folks who are your design heroes currently? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I think the people, um, you know, I've had the 
sometimes luxury, sometimes negative experience of getting to meet tons of people I, I, I admire. And like, I've met some of the nicest people in the world and I've met people that I'm like, Oh, I guess I have to get rid of your books now after having met you. <laughs> um, and, and so like, as I sort of look back, like, I think the people that I've engaged with directly inspire me a lot more. I think it's, you know, people like my former boss at Atlantic records who believed that a designer could have impact on business and business dealings and like how the department runs and the engineering team and like not seeing like a person who was passionate and interested and willing to put in the work and didn't try to put me in a box like is someone I really admire because especially you know 10 or 15 years ago when I was really starting out and working in that industry that was like a really um, it, it uh, maybe advances the wrong word, but like future thinking way of looking at a designer and saying like, you don't just make pretty pictures, you can do other things. And that changed my life. And I really like admire him for that. And I've had other people in my life who've had similar experiences where they were willing to take a chance on me. And I, I hope that I can bring some of that back to, to my team and hopefully be that person who gives people a chance. And, and I think that to me is more exciting than like I love design and I love design books and I've got a closet behind me full of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and those people are amazing and inspiring, but I feel really lucky to work alongside a bunch of really like talented, low ego, hardworking, intelligent, kind people. And like, I just have tons of ad admiration for them. So I, I don't know. I think it's more about the people that surround me than the people maybe I would have looked up to when I was starting out in the industry. Yeah, that's a great, great answer. Um, you know, one of the other questions that we have to ask everybody on the show, cause sort of the theme of the mm -hmm. show and your answer doesn't have to be design or creativity related. Um, but I'm curious what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Oh my God. There's so many, I, I wish the list was shorter because that would probably be healthier, but um, I mean, there's a lot of things that surround me right now. So I've got my drum set here, which is something that, again, I just started playing at the beginning of the pandemic, but that was a, a year ago. And I've hopefully made some progress um, since I couldn't do anything and thought like my four limbs will never cooperate with each other. I, I feel like I've definitely made progress. So that's something I've been trying to do for an hour a day and it's really therapeutic. Um, uh, I, I'm sitting in on the other side, like, so there's a projector screen right here that comes down behind me. And um, that's where I have been playing um, Fortnite, which I know is like, has long since not been cool, but like, I love that game. I just love being able to like go into another world and totally disconnect and not, there are no consequences. And, you know, like it's, it's just like a fun way to turn off my brain that I like. And then, Maybe my third answer, which you can't see, is my dog, Alfie, is like literally sitting in a chair next to me. Like, I think getting to spend time with with my partner and my dog and in this place where we're lucky enough to get to live in Oakland, I feel, I don't know if obsessed is the right word, but I feel very connected and very lucky to be able to have that experience. That's very cool. Um, and you know, bonus points for being obsessed with three things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that might tell you a little bit more about me than I wanted to reveal in the, in the first, you know, half an hour, but, but yeah, I think it's probably truthful. Well, so our, our listeners aren't going to sign an NDA or anything. So don't tell us anything. We're not allowed to know, but <laughs> just, uh, thinking ahead and like, what's next for Adobe? What's, is there anything cool that you can tease out or any types of projects that, that you're excited to be focusing on currently. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we've, we've uh, put a lot of clues out there for people who are paying attention. I think if you look at products like Lightroom, because you use that as an example earlier, we've got an awesome mobile app and an iPad app and a desktop app, and you can kind of use it everywhere. And your content just magically flows. And you don't have to think about it. And like the experiences are there's a continuity there, but we don't try to like squeeze the desktop onto a phone. Like we really try to be thoughtful about those things. I think 
that's a breadcrumb that we've left for people. I think you see us looking at new experiences like Illustrator and iPad, which we talked about. I think that's a breadcrumb for people. I think um, one thing that might not be as relevant for people like us who have been doing this for a while, but we've been, been investing a ton in learning and discovery in our products. We want to make sure that like people can, we can have more creatives in the world. I think that's uh, that's why we get up every day. And I think it gets me excited about being at Adobe and um, we want to make that possible. And so bringing better learning closer to the creation experience is something. So I, I think there's lots of those breadcrumbs. And I think, you know, one thing that we've been, um, you know, public about is, you know, our belief in, you know, augmented reality and sort of the future of like mixed reality computing. Like, I think it's hard for anyone to know what that looks like. I feel like we're in the like Nokia days of mobile where it's like, oh, this is definitely it. And the iPhone came here like, oh, never mind. None of that was real. This is <laughs> like, we're, we're somewhere in that journey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're somewhere in that journey right now. And there's like really wonderful glimmers like the Oculus um, 2 is like as an all-in-one device is like pretty spectacular. There's um, lots of people like moving into this space. And I think, you know, the mix of reality and computing is like super fascinating. Um, again, like it's really hard to know where that goes. And because we're a software company, we'll be on that journey with a lot of partners. But I think that's really exciting. I think the other thing that our team has been and company have been heavily invested in is um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Like I think that is the future of all software. And the way I think about it, I really think about it as um, as an accelerant or as an assistant, right? Like it's AI is not here to do your job. It's here to help, right? It's And I think some of the things we've done in our products around, you know, um, We've got so many great AI features. Again, like video is coming to mind, right? Like auto resizing video for you um, for different aspect ratios and different social networks you want to post on. Like, I don't, I doubt there's probably a lot of people who are like, I really enjoy resizing this video 15 times <laughs> to these different places. And, and and I think that what we, the balance we try to find is like, how do we make that easier for people, but also we don't want to take the control away because you're the professional, you're the creative. Like you need to be able to say like, no, no, I've, I've got this. I need to override what you're doing. And I think that's the balance we really try to strike with that is like, how can we help you move further faster? But in the moment we were like, thanks AI, but I'm going to take the wheel because I know what I'm doing. Like we want to make sure that we allow that as well. And I think finding the right balance is really tricky, but something we think about a lot. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a lot of things, but, um, you know, I think that's the thing about Adobe that has kept me there and keeps people there for a long time is this interesting mix of creativity and technology and like thinking about the future and where everything is going and how we bring sort of art and design and, and, uh, you know, creativity into that new future is, is really fun. Like, Yeah. It's cool. Um, you know, going back to your, your thoughts on your experience at Atlantic records and of course being with Behance and Adobe. Um, I'm curious if there's like a favorite piece of advice that you've carried with you from any of those experiences, or maybe a favorite piece of advice that you like to pass along to your members of your team today. Um, maybe take it in a different direction and tell you one of the worst pieces of advice I've ever gotten. I like that too. <laughs> um, so I think when you're I the was first there, person to flip that one. Yes. Good. Well, then I've, after this many episodes, I feel like I've contributed in some way to the, the canon here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, there's not a lot of advice out there for first time managers, certainly first time managers of creatives, right? I think it's, and I, and I, and I have a, a talk that I've been giving last year or so about design management specifically, because I think there's just missing education around that. And so when I was a brand new design manager for the first time, I was meeting with someone higher up in, in the company. And I won't say which company it was, because it's not really important. And their advice was like, if I wanted people to listen to what I said, I had to I basically had to, to yell at them. Like that was like advice. Like you have to be 
a force and you have to be this kind of person. It's totally to like the old school creative agency way. Of super doing old school. And, you know, I sat down with this person. And I was like, well, is my team delivering work of quality? It's like, oh yeah, the work is awesome. Are we delivering it on time? Oh, you, you all are never late. Are our clients happy? Oh, everyone's super happy. Like, are my people happy? Oh yeah. Like no one ever leaves your team. They stay forever. And I was like, what would that accomplish? Right. Like if we're delivering work that everyone is happy with and like, I, I just, I couldn't understand like what the purpose of that was. And I also just realized like, I'm like, if that's what I have to do to be successful, like I, this isn't, isn't for me. And like, I think about that a lot and I think about how my career in life could have been different if I was like, this person's super successful and people might know their name. And like, I guess I should listen and do what they say. And I just kind of looked inward and I was like, this isn't me. And it's not the kind of manager I want to be. And I think that's something for us to all really be cognizant of. It's really, it's really easy for people to say like, you have to do this or you shouldn't do this. And those things are almost never real or true. And like mm-hmm. every person and every person's experiences and their privileges are also incredibly different. Like, I think most advice is like not transferable. And, you know, it's, it's funny when I give talks, I, I, I address that a lot. I'm like, I have a different experience and a different path and I'm in, you know, I've been really lucky and I, I don't take any of that for granted. And I try to be universal with that stuff, but I don't know. It's just really me realizing like long one way of answering. I think by getting bad advice, I realized like be yourself and stay true to your principles was something that I sort of took the good from the bad. And um, I'm glad I did because I, I don't think I would be a very happy person if I had listened to that advice. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I do think there's a thing about, you know, all of your early experiences and, you know, going between different jobs that it's, it's a great opportunity to learn what not to do. So you're, you yeah. should be paying attention as a young creative to the things that are working as well as the things that aren't working and, and like, why, why don't those work and how might that be different? So it's, I think it's a great yeah. point to kind of question the, the status quo of inheriting this team that everything was good, but you know, they weren't treated well. So right. um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Well, and I think like, I, I know that like luck and privilege and opportunity played a big part in all of this, but you know, I also think a lot or too much about all of these things and like, well, if I'm doing the right thing or if I'm not, and like, I think that's, something that doesn't change. And I think the way that designers maybe instinctually or, or, or taught to think whichever one it is, like benefits them in, in, in management. I think you design an organization, you design processes, you design teams, like all of these things are design problems in a lot of ways. And I am hoping that the skills that I've gained, you know, doing UX design or doing visual design or branding or any of those things come to bear as a, as a, as a leader and as a, just a person. Right. And, and so like, I think it's all one thing. Um, Eric, as we're starting to wind down here, um, I'm curious if there's anything that comes to mind as like an ask or encouragement or a challenge of our listeners, anything that you'd like to charge them with? Oh my God. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, th- I think one of the things I, I think about, a lot and I talk about a lot is designers generally talk a lot about certain topics and none of these topics are bad, but we don't talk about how we work together and how we treat each other and like sort of what we owe each other's designers very often. And like, I am a generally fairly positive person. I try to sort of be that way online. I'm not necessarily telling people to be positive, but it's just like, what are the things we're not talking about? Like, I don't think we're talking about burnout and career longevity and how to avoid that. I don't think we're talking about our relationships with other designers and what those should be like and how we should treat each other and how we should talk about the work we've all put tons of time into. I think we don't talk enough about how you have a career and how you grow in your career and how do you get to the next level and why do you want to get the next level? What does that mean for you? And you know, I don't know that we often talk a lot about 
like many of these issues, right? And they're less concrete than should designers code, which I have an opinion on that one too. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing to talk about. Um, I have a pretty thorough background in coding. So I, I fall on that, that side of things. Like, okay. um, but, but I, I sometimes feel like we have those same conversations over and over again. And then we don't talk about like what we want this industry to be and how we create an industry that, that like is inclusive and sustainable and that we'll all look back in 20 years and be like, I'm glad I'm still doing this versus I would have retired 10 years ago if, if I could. Right. And I think talking about that and those are hard and nebulous and confusing problems and we'll get stuff wrong a million times. I know I have, um, I think those are really important conversations that I wish we had more. And again, it's not, it's not an or I'm not saying don't talk about these other things. Talk about this. I'm thinking just building on what you're already thinking about. Like, Again, how do we apply the way we think and the way we learn and understand the world to the people problems as well as, you know, design problems? Well, maybe those are some topics that uh, we could continue the conversation after this, which is a really good segue to say before we uh, wrap things up here, uh, let our listeners know where they can find you online. And, you know, if they want to have that conversation with you, what are the right platforms and What's your handle for all this? Yeah, I'm on all of them. <laughs> I would say Twitter is, Twitter is probably the best. Um, uh, I'm Eric Snowden on Twitter. And now that I said that out loud, I should... Let me... Hold on. We, might yeah, we can drop them all in the show notes too. So I won't make you remember all of your... Okay, yes. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Eric Snowden on Twitter. My DMs are open. I do my best to respond to everybody. Um, I try to be like open and honest and want to talk to people. I think I owe a lot to the community that I'm a part of and I want to give back where I can. And so I'm around online, I think. And as long as people are respectful and genuine, like I'll have a conversation with just about anyone. It might take a minute because I get a lot of messages, but I really like do my best to reply to all of them. Um, hopefully I didn't just like explore my inbox by doing that. Um, I think that's the main one. I, you know, I'm on Instagram. I'm, I've like been really debating about doing some stuff on TikTok. And while I think like my dance moves probably aren't up to par, I think that, um, I feel a lot of people doing like really great creative tutorials, short form on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I think I've got a lot of like Adobe knowledge squirreled away in my brain that I would love to share with people. Like, there's so much you can do that people just have no idea. And frankly, like I've seen a look on people's faces when we show them some of these things, like my whole world change, or they see like the hours of time they're going to get back. <laughs> and like, I would love to be able to do more of that. I like, I've, I set up an account and I'm like a minute away from doing something there. Um, and I obviously have a Behance profile and everything else, but um and ericpaulsnowden.com, my full name is um, my uh, URL for my website. And um, this is a having EPS as initials. I think it meant I had to work at Adobe. I don't think anyone else would have hired me. Like it was just, it was preordained, I think, at that point. <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, Eric, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and uh, learning more about uh, your role at Adobe. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was really fun. Yeah. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 157 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.